Hey everyone, it's Eugene here and welcome to Forensics Talks. This is episode 82 and today my guest is Alexander de Bruyne and we're going to be talking about 3D forensics in the Netherlands police. Now, first off, before we begin, as always, I always like to have a few people tell me where they're from in the comments section here. So if you are listening, I uh, would love to know where you're from. So go ahead and type the city or the country or whatever it might be and I uh, want to wish you all a welcome here. I uh, also want to say thank you to all the people that were at the Recon 3D user group meeting this past week. Um, we had a whole bunch of people there. It was really wonderful to be able to share information, uh, studies, accuracy studies, tips and tricks, and all kinds of things on scanning with the iPhone LiDAR. And I thought that was a, a really great way to kick off the very first uh, user group meeting. So thank you to all the people who were speaking and congratulations to some of the prize winners who walked away with uh, a few little gifts here and there. Um, remember also, folks, that uh, you can always watch these uh, interviews on YouTube afterwards, so they remain permanent later on. And you can also listen to these on your favorite podcasting platform. So this is on you know, Google, it's on Apple, it's on Spotify. I try to make them available as soon as possible. Uh, usually it's, it's within a day uh, or so once I can get through the editing and such. But yeah, if, uh, if you can, uh, make sure that you uh, definitely uh, get on there. Okay, I can see people from uh, the, the Netherlands already and uh, Slovakia as well, so that's that's wonderful. We're gonna get started here and I'd like to do just a brief introduction. So uh, Alexander de Bruyne is a forensic visualization specialist with the ETVR and that stands for Expert Team Visualization and Reconstruction at the uh, Netherlands Police. Um, he started at the Regional Police in Iceland in 2000 as a forensic photographer, and he was um, interested in photography, but also in um, panoramic photography and 3D model. And he was looking for ways to sort of up his game, so to speak. In 2005, Alexander joined a multi-police agency project group to investigate the adoption of LIDAR and panoramic image scanners with the Netherlands Police Departments. And then in 2015 is when he joined the ETVR group. Now, Alex gives training and support in photography, photogrammetry, data processing, and visualization techniques. His main interest is in XR visualization and the possibilities for usage in criminal investigation. He's part of the PD Vision 3D development team, and I'm definitely going to be asking him about this. Uh, this is a Unity-based general 3D uh, multi-user XR data viewer developed by his team, by the ETVR team, and it's already been used in several court cases. Now, I met Alexander sometime, oh, I think it's around 2011. We were having some discussion on this and we weren't exactly clear, but I know for sure we, we met um, around sometime in 2011. So let me let me bring him in here. Hey, hey Alex, how are you doing? Very well, thank you. How are you? I'm doing great. And uh, hey, really appreciate you uh, being here. Um, yeah, we've. Uh, I guess we've known each other for, for more than ten years. Time flies. <laughs> I was a bit unclear about that, but yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Time. yeah, yeah. Well, we've met multiple times, and uh, I've had the pleasure of meeting your team there. I've I've been over to uh, to where you work, and I've seen some of the things that you guys are doing. And uh, yeah, thanks to everybody for uh, you know for the team there, and you know having you here as a representative is great. And I, I want to get into it here. So mm -hmm. let me ask you about. Let me ask you about your beginnings and you know I, I you know you started in 2000 as a forensic photographer and then you know you start moving into the panoramic stuff in 3d so what was it about or what was it that triggered you to say hey you know what i you know it's not just photography anymore i got to move into the 3d the 3d portion or the panoramic part yeah well it started in 2000 we were still using uh traditional analog photography and it was right about that time that we started to tra transition to digital photography so uh, one of my responsibilities was also running the, the development center, uh, buying film, buying chemicals. <clears throat> so you you have time left. So you start to reevaluate what's actually what you start to reevaluate what's actually the job that I'm doing. And I, for the most part, it was documenting trace evidence that was brought in, but also documenting crime scenes. So you have this new technique, digital photography, which also always had my interest. And you start to think from how can I use this in a more effective way to do my job in an better way and to 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 add value to an investigation in an easy way 
And one of the first things that we started to experiment with was uh, panoramic photog photography. Uh, it was a bit difficult in those days. You needed a special tripod. You had to learn what the nodal point was. Uh, the software was very slow because algorithms like SIFT weren't invented yet. It is still, that was a development we were waiting on. So stitching a panoramic photograph was actually a brute force calculation that took hours and hours. Uh, nowadays, every smartphone can do it. And, and that started to roll, the ball rolling from documenting crime scenes and, and how you can do th those things better. Now, you were later on, uh, like when I was talking about the, the introduction, you were part of a, like this multi-police agency project group. And I wanted to ask you about that because it sounds like all of a sudden there was interest in doing more with, you know, imaging scanners and that sort of thing. And I believe uh, you had mentioned to me before that uh, that had to do with a, well, it, I guess what initiated it was a fireworks disaster. Yes, in uh, 2000, there was a very large uh, explosion in the town of Enschede in the Netherlands. It's in the east of the Netherlands. It's a reasonable, uh, big provincial uh, uh, main city. At that explosion, about 22, 23 people were killed. A uh, thousand people were injured. And an entire neighborhood was blown away. It's just, just one wasteland of rubble and broken houses and a very large hole in the ground. It was a fireworks factory. Uh, it was a small fire and eventually it, uh, it resulted in an enormous amount of fireworks exploding all at the same time. Uh, basically, the whole of the Netherlands police, all technical personnel, were there to, to clear the rubble and to search for human remains. Uh, even it, it, it was literally uh, sifting through tons and tons of rubble. Uh, this also needed to be documented for, for the investigation. There were two teams at that time that could do that. One of them was a, a national uh, traffic investigation unit that had total stations and such, and they actually surveyed the entire site with traditional means, total stations, measuring tapes, etc. Uh, and there was one team from Rotterdam, uh, also traffic investigators, who used photogrammetry in those days. They used uh, roll-eye metric cameras. And they used a helicopter fly around the scene and uh, taking pictures and afterwards uh, using a package that was called CDW, uh, CDW I think, uh, for 3D photogrammetry. Uh, it was all manual point clicking and search on analog photogra photographs. And they discovered something funny. Uh, both teams got excellent results. Those uh, results were combined by the Netherlands Forensic Institute to make a very good animation, 3D models used for simulation, etc. But the funny thing that they realized was that uh, the Netherlands is a very low country. We have lots of water. And basically, if you're building in the Netherlands, you're partially building underwater because the groundwater is very low. Basically, if you uh, shovel a hole in the ground, it will fill up with water. So if you have a large crater, it will also fill up with water. And if you use photogrammetry, you will just get the surface of the water, but you will not get the bottom of that hole. And with traditional surveying, you won't get as much detail, but you can put your surveying stick inside of the hole and you can measure the water depth. So you needed both of those techniques to get a complete picture. And that eventually started the ball rolling. A few years later, there was a company in the Netherlands called Delftec that uh, thought that 3D scanning, LiDAR scanning was a very uh, useful technique. And they gave a presentation and they showed us one of the first Cyrox scanners. There was a very large black uh, wooden box that uh, measured with, I think, maybe a few thousand points per second. It was very slow, but it was a very interesting technique to use. And in Rotterdam, uh, the team that used the photogrammetry started to, uh, was interested in that and sought uh, cooperation with some of the police corpses in the Netherlands. And those in those days, we still had 24 separate police units in the Netherlands. Nowadays, we have one national police. So they started a project. They wanted uh, other units to participate in that. And together they brought two laser scanners and started to experiment in cases. And eventually that resulted in 2004. Uh, one of the first cases in the Netherlands was uh, recorded. There was a shooting incident in Rotterdam. It was in those days we still hired the scanner. It was done also by Delftec, uh, the people who introduced the first scanners. And in 2005, he bought the first scanners. And one of the first cases we actually took was a murder of an activist in the city of uh, Nijmegen, called Louise Verke. 
the region where he was killed was uh, it was a very complex murder. It was unsolved at those time, at, at those at those at those time, and it was it, it didn't look good. But the city was also restoring large parts of the cities, but buildings were being demolished, so the scene needed to be preserved. And that was one of the first cases. The Netherlands police actually uh, completely scanned themselves. So he took uh, panoramic cameras, two laser scanners uh, from different brands, because we didn't want to sell for one brand. We scanned an enormous, uh, a few streets, a few crossroads, in a very busy uh, shopping center in a very large city. And we built a 3D model from that. And, and that's way the first crime scene was preserved in 2005. Okay. And so um, from, from this group of people, obviously, like you joined the ETVR in 2015, but I'm wondering, was the ETVR already established before then because somebody saw some benefit from, from all the 3D technologies that were being used? Yes. The, at the fireworks, there was also, I mentioned, there was this traffic support group. Uh, and that we, at that point, still had 24 different police corpses. Uh, eventually, that, that's in a small country like the Netherlands, very, very small country, but we had about 20 million people living here, so it's very densely populated. It was a very uh, unpractical situation to have only one support team. So eventually, the Netherlands police was reorganized, so we now have 10 regional units, but everybody falls under the same national police, and everybody works in the same way, and every of one of those regions has their own traffic investigation team. So there was no longer a need for a very specialized uh, traffic investigation team that only operated in one spot in the Netherlands. Um, Technology just has become cheaper, it's easier, there's better training for people, so uh, that's all okay. They're all very expert people in the regions nowadays. So that team started to focus more on crime scenes uh, in violence and murder because those, those days that was two, two special, uh, different specialities. Nowadays it's all one. So they renamed themselves from uh, a traffic support unit to a, a technical uh, reconstruction and visualization unit. And they started to support there where they could. And that's okay, how so the ETVR was made. Okay, so let's let's talk about ETVR then. So I, I, I've been there, I've seen like some of the technology that you're using and, and some of the things that you've been working on. But has the, like was the mandate or was the goal of the ETVR, has it changed over the years or has it changed with technology? Um, can you tell me maybe about some of the beginnings and then sort of where you are today in ETVR? There is this saying that says, without uh, change, there's no progress. And the same goes with us. Uh, technology changes so that the needs change. Technology becomes cheaper, faster, smaller, and it's more accessible to more people. Right? Photography hundreds of years, a few hundred years ago, was something that only a few people could do. Nowadays, everybody has a smartphone. But 20 years ago, uh, you had an analog camera. And if you go to, went to a vacation and you weren't halfway your roll of film, you had still 10 left. It would probably take months before you start to develop, because, uh, develop your film because it was a waste to throw it away. Nowadays, photography is something that's very simple and that has changed. And the, 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 the real photographers that we used to have in every police unit are gone now and have done, are doing something different because everybody can take pictures. And the same goes with laser scanning. Through the years, um, needs from the local police units have changed. Uh, scanners have become cheaper sometimes maybe 10 times cheaper and, and easier than are now. Yeah, they used to work with laptops. Nowadays, you have scanners with just one button. Uh, and nowadays, most of the police units in the Netherlands have their own scanning equipment. And if they don't have it, they are in the process of acquiring one. So this year, uh, latest half, halfway this year, every police unit in the Netherlands will have their own scanning equipment. Mm. They already have their own panoramic imaging equipment, and now they will have that too. So our mandate starts to shift more to support and, uh, and research and development and uh, instructing and teaching and developing new technologies uh, in such a way that those police units can work more effectively and, and have some support uh, if they run into trouble. And of course, if, if their scanners need to be calibrated or they're broken or something falls down and uh, doesn't work anymore, we can always go there and, and support uh, if needed. But that's basically has, have be, has become our role now. We used to be a team that went everywhere and scanned everything and measured everything, took pictures. And now we're very much in that supporting role. 
Okay. And so tell me about the, the ETVR team, like uh, approximately how many people are you and what kinds of backgrounds do each of these people have? The amount of people, of course, constantly changes. Uh, at some point we were at 15 people. At this moment, we're 12 people. Some are still in training. Some have been detached to uh, other police units. But we, we are a very broad uh, broad collection of people. It used to be in, in the past that we only had police officers, just people who, who worked on the street, did something with uh, uh, forensic units, did something with photography or with traffic investigations or maybe car electronics, etc. We even had people who were expertise on... Uh, uh, boating accidents that's an entire very fascinating expertise and nowadays we hire people who have ex uh, a background in animation game design uh, archaeology we even have a, a math teacher somebody with a background in particle physics um, and of course a phot photographer <laughs> <laughs> well, a good, a, good yeah, a, a pretty wide ranging group. So, I mean, that's good. You get a lot of different perspectives and a lot of different input in different areas. Right. Um, now, is everyone is everyone trained to do kind of the same thing, or do do people have different sort of roles inside of the group, like special specialities? Yes, the, the the last thing. Everybody has their own interests and their own specialities because. Uh, Somebody with a background in uh, car electronics is not a game designer, and, and the same thing goes both ways. But still, uh, everybody needs to be able to do some basic uh, uh, work. For example, going to a, a location, making scans, ma taking measurements, taking pictures. That those are things that we train all our staff to to do. Everybody has to be able to to go somewhere at a moment's notice and and do their work, because in else you could not get a 24-7 uh, uh, running service involved in the Netherlands because every specific people always need to be on call and this way we, we can spread spread that uh, around. But uh, besides that, everybody has their own specialities that they're better in. Um, some people are very good in PowerPoint, pres uh, in PowerPoint uh, After Effects presentations to present timelines. Other people are very good in organizing big events and, and they're very good in that some in teaching uh, some in videography uh, image uh, processing 3d modeling we have a few very very talented 3d modelers uh, amongst the staff uh, a programmer who just programs so you need a very broad range of expertise to to do this work as you said you need different perspectives on things but you also need a flexible team because somebody with a completely different background might have an idea from his background that is applicable to the work that you are doing at that moment. And it can make things faster or yeah. better, more efficient. Yeah, definitely. And uh, I mean, I, I, I've seen some of the work that you guys have been doing and some of the research and stuff. And I have to say, uh, you know, the Netherlands is whenever I talk about, um, you know, 3D forensics or 3D technologies, a lot of times in other agencies, you know, there may be like one or two or three people that, you know, are given a scanner on top of everything else that they're doing. And it's very difficult for them to sort of adopt it and focus on that particular technology. So they never really become an expert in that area. They're, they become proficient, but maybe it just takes a really long time. And in the Netherlands, I think it's really interesting how you guys have been able to focus. I mean, I think it's a really good example of how something can work and how um, you can produce some really top-notch level work. So. Uh, yeah, I think that's to credit to the to the people there. Um, let me ask you about technology. Is it, really, is it really focused? Because what I see in 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 most of the European countries is there are very very highly schooled, highly trained people uh, who specialize on on their equipment. Who know, uh, for example, in Germany, in Belgium, there are people working with XR and laser scanning who know much more than we do, really. But it's mostly individuals. And I think that the thing that the Netherlands police does really well is that we have a a bar everybody needs to reach that bar they have to uh, uh, be proficient at a certain level and we are able to spread that level over the whole of the country over a large group of people and there are, of course there are some experts but we are guaranteed that we have a basic proficiency level everywhere in the netherlands spread over a very large group of approximately maybe 40 50 people 
Well, I think, and I think this is, this may be a European thing because, you know, in comparison, my, my, here in North America or even in South America, you know, we don't have the same kind of focus. It's, it's much more limited. There are some people that do get time. Uh, there are some agencies, but it's not, a, it's not like there. are like, so for example, people in Germany, I know they have a, they have a good team there uh, that there's some highly trained and skilled people there. Um, people in uh, some of the Scandinavian countries as well, they have like people that are okay. focused. Yeah, as well. So yeah, no. To your point, I, I I think though it's it's a geographical thing. I think there's there's more yeah more of that in Europe than there is over here. So hopefully uh, that's a model that maybe we can uh, look at and, and maybe focus on a bit more. Um, let me ask you about technology. I want to ask you about some of the technology that you've adopted uh, in the in the Netherlands. What what are all the different tools that you know are in your toolkit? I always compare it to a to a carpenter. If you Take a carpenter and you look into his toolkit, you maybe see uh, five, 15 hammers, two saws, uh, etc. Um, they're all tools. And there's also this saying from if you only have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And the same thing goes with, 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 with us. We have a lot of different tools that we use in different circumstances uh, for, different, for different jobs. But we have uh, lots of things. We have several different uh, kind of LiDAR scanners. We have total stations from different brands different kinds of uh, 360 cameras, uh, depending on, on, on the, the, the type of location that you are, the time that you have, the quality that you need, lots of different software packages. Um, it, it all depends on what job you're doing and what is needed at that moment. Yeah. Um, and what is probably the most utilized tool there uh, on most cases? Is it, is it the laser scanner? A most use in the most uh, no the 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 panoramic three hundred and sixty uh, camera really it's definitely yes lidar is is a very great tool and we use it a lot but we use the the panoramic camera slightly uh, more because it's it's the best tool that we have uh, if I have a lidar scanner it needs a lot of processing it needs time it needs visualization and it needs explanation if I go to a court I need to explain what a lidar scan is what accuracy is, accuracy on LiDAR scanner is, as you know, a very uh, daunting task to explain to somebody who doesn't know, who is, no, uh, has never worked with that. But I don't need to explain a panoramic image because everybody has seen things like Cyclomedia or, uh, or Google uh, Street View. Uh, if I put somebody who has never seen a, who has never seen one of our 360 presentations. If I put that person behind one of our presentations, he will take a mouse, he will click in, in the image and will direct the mouse around. He will know what he's doing. He, he sees, a, for example, a door and he knows hey, that's a door. But if I show you a door uh, made with a, a scan with a LiDAR scanner, I need to explain what you're seeing. And that's, that's the difference in it. Uh, so that makes a panoramic image one of the most powerful tools that we have. Uh, after that, of course, LiDAR and photogrammetry, just traditional photography. Uh, you were in the noise conference and they talked about the renaissance of photogrammetry. Uh, I think that's absolutely true. It's amazing what we can do nowadays with almost any image source and what we can extract from it also in cold cases. But those three are the most used tools. And of those three, uh, 360 degrees is photography and videography is the, the one we use the most. Yeah, I mean, in terms of documentation, the, the 360 camera uh, is uh, really beneficial because of its a view. The field of view is, is amazing. You get a full view. You can move it and do these virtual tours and things like that. And that is half the battle, right? And I think you would probably agree that there's, there's no comparison between a good 360 camera or a, a 360 system and the panoramic image that you get on a laser scanner. They're, they're not quite the same. Some are okay, uh, but yeah, a uh, high res, really good camera doing 360 will often give you much better results. Um, and let's, I, I'd like to ask you about the training that you guys receive as well, because obviously, you know, some of it you learn on your own, but there's training as well. And maybe some group things that you do about how often a year do you get training or do you get together as a group to do like exercises and things like that? Well, exercise, of course, is very important. We try to do uh, several collaborative exercises with our colleagues in the, in the Netherlands, with all the different teams. We try to at least organize one uh, exercise together once a year so everybody knows what to do. If, the, if, if you have a large-scale explosion or a disaster, that everybody's running around so you, you uh, know what to do and how to work and what data you need to deliver to uh, be able to use the data. 
and we try to uh, we we try to organize one maybe every one every year or every two years something uh, a day in which we exchange knowledge we, uh, two years ago it was a vr day last year it was a day in which we invited lots of scanner manufacturers at the police academy in the netherlands and had some cases and two days uh, long we were watching people scan and talk about the newest products and present the results uh, we, we we try to facilitate in that besides that we also give lots of trainings at the netherlands uh, police academy uh, we give some trainings and lectures at some of the the, 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 the schools, the forensic uh, educational facilities that are in the Netherlands. And we try to, to hire training, uh, be it online, be it in person, uh, for different subjects. For example, one of the, the trainings we got was from you, the basic IAFSM uh, certification course. Uh, but we are also uh, a surveyor at some point who gave us a very uh, good explanation about how surveying work. And lots of it is, of course, uh, self-study. Uh, reading yeah, the documentation that manufacturers provide to you, lots of stuff on YouTube, uh, internet, uh, different sites like LinkedIn Learning, plural sites, and the list goes on and on. Yeah, I'm looking at this one here. It uh, looks like this was 2019, uh, pre-COVID here, but this was like a forensic archaeological recovery uh, ex exercise here. So well, I, I don't know why it was part of your team. Oh, you're, it must have been part of your team uh, who was helping with this. Yes. This training was given by a team of archaeologists that were instructing other people how to uh, investigate clandestine graves. And we assisted in the training by showing how to... Uh, how to measure. One of the, the, the archaeologists at the Netherlands Forensic Institute, Mike Groen, has a very specific protocol that he uses to document these kinds of graves. And he works a lot with us because we know his protocol so we can assist him without bothering him with details. And he is trying to spread that methodology uh, through people who want to learn it. In this case, it was done by the ENFI, the European Network of Forensic Institutes. I think it's a training given in the UK. One of my colleagues, uh, uh, Laudens Post, who is our surveying expert at this moment, together with Twan. But Twan's retiring very soon. Mm -hmm. And they were giving that training. Oh, excellent. Well, I want to start moving into the, the XR and the, your area wow. that sort of been focusing on or whatever. And I do have some other questions about some other things you guys are doing. But let's talk about, um, let's talk about the beginning. When did you first, um, or when did ETVR first start looking into these, you know, XR, virtual reality, augmented reality. Um, yeah, how did, how did that come about? Ooh, uh, first time, it was probably around 2040, around the time that, that Oculus first started to uh, develop their uh, development kits, the DK1, DK2. Around that time, we started to experiment with it from what, what's, the po what's the possibilities with it. At that point, it was still a bit technical. It was very hard to get it to work in Unity or Unreal. Uh, then Microsoft eventually came with the HoloLens. And uh, a few different police uh, uh, departments at the, the, the Nash Central Unit that, that we are a part of uh, started to look into that because what, what are the possibilities with those techniques? And they started a... Uh, Cross department projects uh, about XR techniques. And some of the parts of that project are still running today. And we were focusing mostly on how can we uh, visualize a crime scene? Because you have to realize that we have been using 3D scans since 2004. That's, that's a very long time. Practically every major case in the Netherlands has been documented with either and uh, 360 photography and or LiDAR uh, scanning. So there's a lot of material that we have, uh, enormous amount. But the usage, usage of it is, is, is lacking behind the amount that we collect because it's complicated to show to people. You need a very good laptop or, a, you, need, or you even need to, to bring a high-end workstation to court or to a team. Uh, you need network capabilities to, to transmit data. You need to do it in a safe and legal way because we have several requirements on sensitive police data, how we can transport that. Uh, you have to take that into account. So it's very hard to get the data to people and then you still have to get them to understand it and to see the possibilities because uh, police officers, uh, the, the, the ones who do the tactical investigation, are not technical personnel. So they need 
things that they see use of and understand. And they need to understand it to be able to ask us questions so we can make specific simulations or visualizations or measurements for them. And with some people uh, uh, that clicked, they understood what we were doing and, and we, we saw lots of repeat uh, usage from them, but from other people not. So we thought that XR technologies might be something that helped people to use this data and to, to ask questions for, uh, for specific products. So we started to develop uh, with, the, with the team a viewer in Unity and our requirements with it were, we have to be able to get this, this, this point cloud that we have as quickly as possible inside a uh, something that, that people can use to view the point cloud and or a 3D model and or uh, 360 photography. And that eventually grew into what we are nowadays calling a PD vision. PD, that's basically the, the Dutch uh, abbreviation for crime scene. It stands for Plaats Delict, mm -hmm. uh, very official term. <laughs> the 3D is uh, uh, put behind it because uh, it, it tells a bit more uh, about it, what it is, but it's basically a Unity project that's pre-configured in which you can very quickly import a point cloud, place some 360 degree pictures, place normal ph photographs, movies, and you have a viewer that you can run on a laptop on a computer or on a XR device, for example, an Optus Quest or an HTC Vive or any other uh, head-mounted device for, for that manner, all in the same viewer that's built in Unity. And now it's con con continuously evolving. It used to be just a Unity project, but now it's a project built in Unity with its own editor. So we now have an executable that you start up and you can import your data, place it in an environment and, uh, and use it. So it's, it's something that's very, that's a very low usage threshold for as well as the person who makes the content as well as for the person who consumes the content. Interesting. And we had some uh, very interesting cases that we have known with that. Yeah, so so a couple of things that you brought up there, and one of them is the fact that you know you're, you're, you said you make it easy to import some things. And a lot of people don't appreciate that um, VR is your, the VR experience is heavily dependent on the quality of the models that you make. And so a lot of times, well, a couple of things that have come to my mind. So the first one is you watch these uh, advertisements and things like that on, on the internet or, or whatever, and they say VR and they have these amazing views or whatever. That's all video production. It has nothing to do with the actual experience because when you actually try it, it's completely different. And the other thing is that it's not easy to take the raw data and then all, you know, there's no magic button and all of a sudden it, it just shows up in VR. I mean, photogrammetry has an advantage because you're already creating a meshed model, but even then you often want to repair, fix, optimize. Like there's a lot of different things that you want to do to make the experience um, as good as possible. So what can you tell me about the that part of the workflow for you? I mean, the fact that you're bringing in scan data just on its own, I, I think is a fantastic idea. I think that, you know, it just, it's the raw data. There's very little manipulation, but um, how, how do you bring in all the different pieces and is it a big effort? Well, basically we try to build that benching button. Uh, no, it's it, we're not there yet. It's not a, you still need some knowledge about how technology, how this technology works, to prepare the data for usage. But we are striving to make it as automated as possible. Um, but the better you you need to be aware that if you use this data, for example, a, a point cloud and three D model, uh, a point cloud is something that you can walk in or look around in. But depending on the quality of the point cloud, it's very splotchy. The color can be bad. Uh, lightning and, and panoramic photography is a thing. Uh, polarization of point clouds can be tricky or, or even have very large parallax depending on the scanner that you're using. You have to be aware of all those things uh, when you're preparing your data. But still, if you have a good point cloud, uh, there are tools in point cloud visualization renderers that can make a point cloud look very decent. If you, if you just get the right point size, if you uh, use some uh, optimized lightning tricks, uh, PC uh, fee, for example, in cloud comparison, one of those examples. Uh, you can even mesh a point cloud, or you can use photogrammetry software like uh, the one uh, from the one everybody uses. I try not to name brands. <laughs> um, 
uh, to, to measure point clouds and use that for us visualization, we, we try to, we used to make our own models. And, and then I use model in, in the way that is defined as a simplified version of reality, very schematic, very blocky uh, 3D representation of volumes. That's what we used to use. Uh, we used to use Maya for it. Nowadays they use 3D Max, but okay, I can't have everything. Um, uh, but we, we try to steer away from that nowadays because there's a problem with that. Uh, our core tenants are two things. We need, the things that we make need to be reproducible and they need to be verifiable. Okay. If I make a 3D model and you make a 3D model from the same point, based on the same point cloud, there will be differences. Even if you use software that that the plane fits and, and, and fits on the cloud themselves, there always will be minute dif differences. And I need to be to guarantee to a court, to a lawyer, to a contract expert, that, that if he follows my uh, working protocol, my guidelines, that he will get almost exactly the same result within a specific given tolerance. And I cannot do that with manual modeling. So we try to prefer software that can do the modeling for us. The results are not as pretty as a handmade model, but I can guarantee it's accurate with accuracy within a certain tolerance. And I get, can give a number with that. And if it gives, can, can give somebody a number, you can check it against that number. Right, right. It's something quantitative that you can check. Right, right. That's a good point. So we, we prefer those kinds of techniques. And one of the upsides of it, the downside is, of course, the, the image quality will be slightly less. But the upside is, if you have an automated process, uh, you can automate it in such a way that if you have an importer, for example, for PD Vision, that you can also use that automated process as a preprocessor for your data import and automate as much as you can. And that's something that we're still developing and working on, but it get, gets better and better. So is, is PD Vision 3D, what, what is the... What's the end game with PD Vision 3D? I mean, obviously you, you want to use it to bring in stuff like that, but is this something that's going to be proprietary to the Netherlands police? Is it something that will be open later for other people to use? Are you looking to sell it? Like what, what's the what's the plan with it? The plan is to be open. Uh, it's something that's made with, with uh, taxpayers' money. Uh, so we, we, we want to, to open it up. Uh, it might be slightly restrictive because one of the, the, the uh, channels that we're looking at is the, the tool repository from Europol. Uh, that's one of the things that we're looking at because they, they can do the hosting and, and development. They have a Git, uh, GitLab, for, uh, for example, which they can use for development and documentation and such. Uh, so that's one of the venues that we're looking at. But uh, our idea is fun. if you can open it up, it can stay alive because there's always the possibility that the uh, police service like ours can be reorganized uh, people retire, people disappear, and eventually, if it's just dependent on us, it will die. So if we open it up, it will at least be available to many people. But we uh, we still need to do some work with that because it's built in Unity, and in the beginning, we used some uh, bought assets. Those are licensed, and we need to remove those before we can open it up and distribute to people because we want to do it in a legal way. Eventually, we are a police department. Um, so we need to do, do things the right way, and, and that's something we're still working on. We had a, the, the, the fortune to hire a dedicated programmer for this. Uh, he's at this moment at the Police Academy in training. It will take a few months, and then he can start full-time working on uh, PD Vision. Uh, the end game of PD Vision is, uh, as I told you, it, it needs to be a viewer for three-dimensional data that's easy to use for people, also easy to fill for people. Uh, there are different kinds of customers that we have, but our main customer is a investigation team that, that wants to view a location that's for their interest. But uh, other applications of it are court presentations, some training exercises, but training is mostly the department of the Netherlands Police Academy, and they have their own suite of wonderful, absolutely wonderful training tools in VR. Uh, they started doing that uh, during the Corona crisis to, to facilitate training at home. Did a wonderful job, uh, but for some training exercises in some very specific cases, we try to facilitate in those also. And that's mostly for uh, crime scene training exercises. For example, uh, one of the, the, the collaborative exercises of the NSV was done uh, in PD Vision, and we are looking at it to do it again this year for the for the next collaborative exercise. But also for people who need to exercise in specific environments. Uh, 
uh, for example, uh, you have a kind of SWAT team that needs to be able to secure uh, uh, the building, a building of the Dutch government. They uh, they need how they need to know how to approach a certain dangerous situation, and they can of course they can train in the life building. And that's always the best thing that you can do. But that building is not always available, and people will panic. It costs a lot, so you can do at least a part of the preparation in VR. Not everything, because it, it is not representative of your real world, because there's no physical contact with your environment. You miss senses like smell, hearing, but you can process, uh, uh, train uh, uh, procedural. You can do procedural training in, in what order you need to do things, and you can get your initial orientation in a environment. And, and that's what PD Vision is a very good tool for, because it's very quick to fill. If I want to do an exercise and orientate myself in a building, I just can send somebody with a scanner to it, or I can uh, make a drone fly over a, a parking a parking lot, and I can uh, take pictures, uh, calculate those to a 3D model or a point cloud, uh, directly put it in PD Vision, and within a day I have a wonderful presentation format. And yeah. that's what what our end game is: making it yeah. as quick and as automated as possible. And you made you, you raised some really good points about the the value of VR, and I think that was something that I was going to ask you. So you already mentioned training, and I think training is a no brainer. It's great for like simulation and practicing and stuff like that. So that 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 I think has um, absolutely that, yeah good good great value. You also mentioned about well, we talked about a few other things, and sometimes I get a little bit rubbed the wrong way because I hear people talk about VR about how it's going to change everything in the world and also and, and I believe it has some value but I'm not as optimistic as some people I, I think it has some some things that it does really well and there's just some things that are just not going to replace like just hands-on and, and, and other things so let, let's talk about some of the some of the main or key areas uh, that where VR is most advantageous what, what would you say are some of the key things there? Uh, definitely training. VR has been around for a very long time. I think in the 80s, the first systems were being developed that were very large and bulky, but okay, TVs were also large and bulky and expensive, and they caught on and VR didn't. Um, and if you look at the state of the industry right now, the big players, uh, Microsoft completely demolished their uh, uh, MRTK team. Uh, Meta is downsizing uh, five. Uh, HTC is... is lagging a bit behind Oculus, I think. Sometimes they're catching up, sometimes not. But but there's not very much development happening at that, those fields at this moment. It's the, the industry is a bit pulling back, so to speak. So the technology, it was a hype. It really was a hype. And uh, a year ago, we were on the top of the hype cycle, and now it's settling. And so in a few years, we'll see some decent adult applications for VR. Uh, probably different than what you're thinking about now, but at this moment, training is most definitely the, the, the best application for, uh, for, for VR. However, uh, our application is something different. We can use it for training, but our application is mostly viewing locations. So what we use it for specifically is for, we have a crime scene, uh, there's an investigation happening at that moment. Uh, during the forensic investigation or maybe before it, maybe during, maybe slightly after, we go in and document the scene. Uh, the, the investigators of that case cannot enter the scene. And they want to inspect it as soon as possible, because in the first 24 hours, those are the most important to, to, to interview people, to get leads. And they want to view the crime scene. And we can do that with pictures, but you know, if, if I take 100 pictures, you take 100 pictures, you have two different photo sets, and it is very hard to look at the crime scene through some leads somebody else's eyes. That's where 360 photography comes in. That, that's, that's, that's a godsend in that case. But VR can be even better. Uh, we can build a VR environment for those people within 24 hours if we, if we really work for it. Um, because you have to put in the hours, of course. You have to process your data. But that, that's one of the main applications that we see to just give the, the, the detectives themselves a good overview of a crime scene uh, also to give steering information from, okay, we know you're still working on it, but we see something in the corner there that looks like a laptop. Can you uh, get that for us and uh, uh, give us that? Or from, uh, how many coats are hanging on uh, in the hallway or how many cups are on the table? It just gives a lot more information and context. 
it's not a substitute for the traditional means of uh, documenting a crime scene. It's never, ever, ever a replacement for photography in any way whatsoever. That's, that's the first thing that you do, and it will be the main job of the documenter. But it's a nice addition in that, in some cases, can have some benefits. One of the other things that we're using it for is for presentations in court. There are cases uh, in which a court needs to go to a uh, location of a crime to inspect that location. That's uh, very hard to do because it takes a lot of organizing. It's expensive. We need to rent a location, make it safe. And that's not always possible. Or in some cases, the location is just not plain accessible because it's dangerous. Uh, maybe it has collapsed, burned down, or it's completely uh, renovated and a completely different building. Because court cases take time. And if somebody gets murdered in a house and it was his or her house, the house will be sold. Somebody else renovates the house and it will be changed. In those cases, all you have is your original data. You can make a reconstruction or a visualization. Well, in this case, we call it a reconstruction because it's just plain data and it's hard measurement data. So in our, our eyes, that's a reconstruction. And we can take the court in virtual reality to that location. And we have done that on several, uh, uh, several occasions to bring a court back to an otherwise inaccessible location to inspect a crime scene and to make their own measurements in some cases or make their own uh, observations based on the testimony of the of the suspect. And yeah, the, so, um, sorry, so you made, you made another point that I wanted to bring up, and that is the fact that, you know, with the investigator, well, both for the investigators and for the court or for jurors or for judges, whoever is going to be immersed in this thing, being able, um, or I think another thing that... Uh, you, what you're bringing about here is you can look around. So your perspective, what you can see whenever visibility, you know, what somebody said they saw or something like that is in question, this could be a good way, VR could be a good way to test that, no? True, very much so. Because the traditional way of taking a uh, field of view of a witness is taking a panoramic image or a photograph. But it's just done from one point. If I have a window and I want to look outside of the window, and if I move from one point of the window to the other point, and I want to document what somebody can see, I also have to take into account that there are also obstacles further away from the window. So if you want to uh, image uh, or reconstruct all possibilities, you need to, to take a picture from every imaginal point between those two uh, in that range. And taking a, a photograph from every point is impossible because there are an infinite amount of possibilities. So the only way that you can do it is document a crime scene as much as possible to, to scan, to take pictures and make the, let the judge make their own uh, observation. But even then, you still have a, a, a discrete sample size of your scanner. So there are still possibilities in between those. It's not holistically uh, captured. But it's as good as we can do it with the technology now, and it's better than a picture. Uh, one of the, the prime examples of that is the, the, the field of view of a, uh, a driver in a car. From uh, Why did that bicyclist disappear behind the A-frame uh, of, the, of the car? It, is it really possible? Uh, and you can verify if it was possible for the driver that he could have had a line of sight on that location. It does not say anything about if he actually saw the, the person, that he actually... Uh, uh, ah, translation, uh, if you actually uh, was, was, was aware of the person, but you can verify if it's possible or impossible to actually have a line of sight from a given location. You can even move, move to front, try to look around something, try to look in your mirrors. Uh, and, and that's something that, that can be helpful for the judge to make his ruling. Yeah, for sure. For and do you ever um so for example like let's say for example you're building a case for the investigators to look at do you ever do anything where you do some form of analysis where let's say you, you can overlay uh, a bullet trajectory path or for example you could say well we did some kind of a blood stain pad analysis and incorporate that so like the results of an analysis inside of the vr like in the context of the crime scene is, is that something that you do as well in some cases yes but mostly no because we have several rules that we have to abide to, luckily. Um, and those rules tell us that you can only make an analysis if you're an expert in that specific field. So you have to be a certified expert in that specific field to make that analysis. And we have some, several experts in our team within uh, some fields uh, with traffic accidents, with boating accidents, etc. 
But most of the time we demand that if we visualize something in a document of crime scene, and we have to, 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 to make a visualization from that, it has to be based on a report with somebody's signature uh, below it who testifies that he or her is an expert in this field. He or she made this analysis and this is the result. And that the thing that I visualize, I, I showed it to them. They give their uh, approval in that and they also sign for that. And, and then we can use that. So it's a very long and, and, and long process for that to do it as, as, as pure as we can do. You, you mentioned the word reconstruction, and I want to ask you this because this came up in a conversation that I had a, a couple of months ago at a conference, and it was the difference between what is a reconstruction and what is a recreation. And sometimes people, you know, use the word reconstruction when they're doing recreation or, or something different. So I'm just, is there a way that you sort of define the two in your mind or how you separate the two? Yeah, but everybody has their own uh, uh, definitions for those two things because in different contexts they mean different things, especially if to take translation from language, one language to the other in, into account. Would we make the difference between that a reconstruction is based on hard measurement data uh, and visualization uh, can be based on, for example, a witness statement that can be soft data that it's not uh, verifiable within a certain range. It's, it's something that somebody put on paper but you don't know if it's true or not or false or a hypothetical scenario and that that's the difference that we draw so if he's talking about the reconstruction it what what we see in the reconstruction is something that we have hard data for of course yeah. within a certain range because measuring something is approaching a certain accuracy so it's never 100 percent but we have a very good idea of that percentage of accuracy and if we're talking about the visualization we don't have that yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, I usually that that is part of it for me as well as my definition. But if, um, I also incorporate what it's going to be used for. And if I'm going to be proving something or trying to say somebody is guilty or somebody was at this location and they fired the shots based on that work, then I also have to think about it. If I'm using it to prove something, it's it's reconstructive. Uh, but if, like you said, you don't have hard data, or maybe it's just demonstrative, you want people just to see the crime scene, you just want to do a walkthrough or something. I'm not really proving anything, but it's helping the court somehow to, uh, you know, to get a better sense of the crime scene or something like that. In that case, it may be more of a, uh, it still may be hard evidence, um, but I'm not really using it as, as uh, to prove anything per se. So I don't have an analyst coming in and doing bullet trajectories and things like that. I think that's also maybe an important part that has to be considered too. But yeah, very, very interesting. Which leads us to, since we're talking about court and VR and everything else, is some of the cases. And, and uh, one thing that uh, the Netherlands police does really well is they're all over the media. So you've got YouTube videos, you've got uh, new uh, clippings and news and anyone that does a search now, unfortunately a lot of it is in Dutch, but you can just hit the translation uh, thing and, and you can get a pretty good sense of what's going on. So I want to ask you about court cases and um, where where has this been used so far and how has it been used? Well, um, there's two court cases that, that, that are very nice to talk, talk about. One of the cases was something that was called a sailboat murder. It was a, uh, a retired couple that was uh, making a world trip with her sailboat and at some point uh, near a country, near a coastline, uh, one of the couple died and uh, the husband of this uh, woman was suspected of her murder and he told the court okay uh, she was murdered by pirates who went come, came on board our ship uh, I was uh, uh, beaten and she was beaten and she eventually died by strangulation and it was a very chaotic story understandable of course if you're beaten and your 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 wife is being strangled uh, of course everybody would be confused but uh, the, the story was a bit strange from from how could he have seen something or not have seen something and the space inside a small sailing yacht is very restrictive and can certain uh, things are possible to do with several people in a very small space and the court had no idea and it was not possible to actually visit this sailing yacht because it was in uh, uh, in police property somewhere outside of Europe. So it was very hard for the court to go there and, and view this. Luckily, uh, 
two colleagues from a forensic surface, uh, one of the regional forensic services, were allowed to go to this boat and inspect it. Uh, we loaned them a LiDAR scanner and instructed them in how to use it. And luckily nowadays, some laser scanners are so simple that almost everybody can use it. And I have very smart colleagues, or we can just instruct very well, but I think we have very, very, very smart colleagues. And they made excellent LiDAR scans in this boat. Uh, well, it was in the water. They made excellent photo series and using those uh, image sources, we were able to get a very good point out from the interior of the, the ship, uh, make a 3D reconstruction based on that data and put it in PD vision and present this to the court in such a way that we had a chair, but it was uh, uh, corresponding to a certain location where somebody was sitting. So everybody could sit on the chair, look around, see how the space were. Uh, at some point, uh, uh, the lawyer of the suspect wanted to uh, view a few uh, figurines in a certain pose, and we were able to just make it very quickly because one of the things that we had in PD Vision was a, a mannequin-like puppet uh, that was posable inside of the, the things. It's something that Unreal has standard, but we had to build in one of the small differences. They did something really wonderful with it in Sweden, I think. Um, and in this, this way, we were able to, to visualize certain situations and the court was able to make their own observations in this, uh, this small space. And eventually this man was, uh, was set free. And, and, and so I think the, the, the 3D model and the VR presentation was one of the things that the courts used to get a clearer picture of, of, of the situation. That's also what they uh, said in one of the articles. Now, logistically, the, you know, implementing VR uh, so, for example, here in North America, where, where it's, when it's a jury-based uh, trial or something like that, you've got a lot of people that you have to try and figure out how to get all these headsets or whatever. So, in your case, though, you had one set up, and the the, the system is different in the Netherlands. So, yes. um, okay, so uh, you you're dealing with less people, I'm, I'm guessing, right? True. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So there's there's is there more than one judge, or is there typically one uh, judge and then obviously the two lawyers and uh, how many more people get to sit and, ex and experience this? It, it depends on the, on the type of court that you're uh, that you're in front of. But if you're talking about a, uh, a, a large violent crime, it's something called a meervoudige kamer. That means there's three judges uh, who, who preside over the case. We don't do not have a jury system. Uh, of course, a jury system has its advantages and disadvantages. And the same with our system. No, there's no perfect justicial system in the world uh, but we do our best yeah for sure in, in canada and, and everywhere else but we just have uh, three judges one in this case only one defense lawyer uh, one prosecutor uh, a scribe court scribe uh, and several expert witnesses who and the, the scribe, of course himself who, who went through this so it does take a, a large part of a day to to show everybody this and you also have to take into account uh, safety issues. Uh, I, one of them is, of course, if you have a violent suspect, uh, you, you're giving him something that he can throw in a courtroom. Uh, that might not be a smart idea. But also emotional aspects. Uh, I have seen people who in, uh, became very emotional and started to faint when they were viewing a crime scene uh, through VR. So you also have to take that into account. And our experience is that at least 10% of people cannot handle uh, the images that you see in VR because they get vertigo, motion sickness, just become dizzy, disorientated. And you also have to take that into account. People sometimes just fall and it has yeah. happened. Yeah, uh, well, I, I've seen it because it happened here at the office. I, I had somebody, somebody was trying out the VR, like a game or whatever, and they put their hand on a, to lean on a counter thinking it was there. <laughs> And it wasn't there. And so, you know, you just, you get mixed up in your mind, right? And I think we talked about this before too, like the the feeling that um, of heights. So for example, you can actually, somebody can take you to the edge of a, a cliff or a mountain and you look down and you know you're standing on the ground, but your eyes and your brain are registering something else. And I'm sure you've had that experience. The exact the same experience. We, uh, one of the, the career ending moves that I did was uh, putting our no, new division head on, on the top of the Empire State Building with it now, <laughs> without knowing that she was uh, afraid of heights. Uh, not a smart thing to do, but it went okay. But um, now one of the demos that we mostly give to people is putting them on top of a large lighthouse. 
and then making them look uh, uh, over the edge and pushing them off. Um, <laughs> you know it's not real, but if you're falling down and you see yourself falling down, uh, you will try to catch yourself when you when you land on the ground. It's, it's an involuntary reaction. It's something that everybody does, even if you know it's fake and you not feel yourself falling. So VR is a different experience than when you're looking at a screen. It's also more immersive. It can bring back memories. And we're also looking in that uh, for using it as a maybe a tool to assist in uh, uh, guided interrogations on location. We're also looking into motion capture. Uh, one of the things that we also have in, uh, in our VR module in PD Vision is that we can use it with six people simultaneously in either the same room or different locations, as long as they're on the same network. Uh, and in some cases, we also need that. Uh, so, so if, but, but generally, uh, I just saw one of the comments that uh, uh, regarding the, like herding a uh, a flock of cats. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you have several people in inside of the same room, uh, you need to be very aware that people will eventually touch each other unless you have very good motion tracking. And that's something that we're looking into now. There are several systems, some are very expensive, but uh, five, HTC just uh, pro announced one of the, a new system uh, yesterday, I think, that looks very promising. And there are several other solutions that we're looking into. We, we do have a motion capture rig based on a large suit with, with trackers on it, but it's almost impossible to put six people at the same time in it because it loses calibration very quickly. Um, but generally, it's better just to put people in, in separate rooms and, and make them work in a safe environment. We even experimented with, with, with those treadmills that you also see for VR use. Um, uh, there are several brands uh, being, most of them consist of a plastic ball that you're walking in uh, on silicon sh uh, sole shoes. Um, the developer that was developing that in those days for us used that as a warm up for his uh, powerlifting sessions because using those systems is extremely tiring. Uh, it, it's very uh, hard to move. It's very unreal. Um, it, it doesn't really work very well. Just walking mm -hmm. around on a flat, flat surface is better. This is the system that you're talking about that is it's like a, a it's a portion of a sphere, like a, a small yeah. portion of a, of a sphere. And you're basically your feet slide. There's no rollers or anything, is there? Or, or do your feet just slide? But they, there are different systems. Some systems do use rollers. Some just use roller skates that are very, uh, very advanced or moving floors. But our system need was a half plastic ball in which you slide with very slippery shoes. But even so, then, it's, it's very... Uh, you really have to put some force behind it to make your feet move. Yeah. So let me ask you, so do you think it makes sense then to, for example, do something in three degrees of freedom as opposed to full motion and moving around in six degrees of freedom? Like, so I, for example, here, putting a jury into six degrees of freedom is a lot easier because at least you can guide them through, you know, you sit, you, you bring them to one position and they can look around, but they can't move around. And so that might be a good a good intermediate step before going with full, uh, you know, full VR and six degrees of freedom. Because there are like there are some technical challenges with getting twelve or, or ten people inside of a the same scene and all being able to move around. Yes. So yeah, but have you thought about done. that? If it needs to be done, it needs to be done. It's as simple as that. If it needs to be done, we will make it happen somehow. It might be difficult. It might not be, but it has to happen in some case. But uh, it is easier to put somebody in a three degree uh, degrees of freedom environment, and that's probably out of the best way of using VR on a large scale. Uh, for example, we have a team in Rotterdam. Uh, one of my colleagues, Nielsen Pomp, uh, Karin Verwij, they they uh, they make three sixty degree images on crime scenes and directly put them in a smartphone and use a smartphone holder, a cool cardboard or some other uh, small fewer, you have very cheap ones, uh, some made from plastic for a few euros. And you can use those, use two-dimensional VR on a smartphone. And that works surprisingly well. It gives yeah. a very good image, even if it's 2D. But nowadays you also have uh, three uh, stereographic panoramic cameras like the Insta Pro, uh, Insta360 Pro, for example. Uh, and that works very well. Uh, you, you get advantages, what we were talking about earlier. People understand pictures. They understand a photograph. 
and it basically looks like a very large view master. You know, the, the children's toy that you had uh, when you were small with uh, with a stereographic uh, yeah. uh, Diaz. And and that that's something that people understand and can use, and they can use it with practically any good smartphone. And every police officer in the Netherlands has has a good smartphone. So one of the things that we are investing in is not only making visualizations, but also trying to develop and provide infrastructure. Uh, that's not something that we can do on our own. There are several developers in the Netherlands busy with it. Um, because you need secure storage, you need a back end, we need a front end. But at this moment, we have a very well working concept of a panoramic image viewer on the police network that is accessible for any uh, a police officer in the Netherlands that is attached to that specific case and has rights to view data on that case because our data protection laws are very strict. Uh, but the infrastructure is there for panoramic images. And the next step is using PD Vision as a web based viewer. Uh, they'll probably have to uh, rip out the point cloud functionality from it because web based point clouds. It is possible, but our network might be a bit overloaded. Mm -hmm. um, but we're trying to make different viewers for that. So that's also something that we are developing. Okay. Or let me, are ask, you, developing. Let, let me ask you about some of the risks of VR, because there's there's obviously some benefits, but there's also some risks, right? And Definitely. Um, yeah, so uh, what do you see as some of the risks and you know maybe how we can mitigate some of those risks? Well, in the Netherlands, I, I don't know how it, it's in, in North America, but in the Netherlands, there is still a discussion if we use colorized photographs in our reports, uh, how this affects people. And that's talking about photographs. And this, this discussion is still being held. And now we made a switch to VR, which is even more immersive than just a picture. In some cases, we have 3D models that are terribly detailed and show gruesome scenes. And if we don't know what a picture does with somebody emotional, uh, with, with their uh, reasoning and their, their decision forming, from then how can we say that we actually know what a VR model will do if it's very realistic? And those are areas that we need to be very aware of. Besides that, if you are using VR, you need to be very careful about your coordinate systems, your scaling issues, accuracy in tracking, frame rates. There's also all kinds of different levels of technical issues that you need to be aware of that can influence your, 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 um, uh, how you observe things. And for example, uh, the color of the screen. Uh, how can I calibrate the screen of a digital display like a head mounted device? There is no technology for that yet. Mm -hmm. Uh, different systems have different kinds of resistors that they use for projection. Uh, some have very high resolution and some are not. And some people have really problem, problems with that. Some people get nauseous with a low frame rate. And there's all kinds of problems, uh, too many to actually name them all. And, and we have very little knowledge about those. Of course, that knowledge will be built in through the years when we experience them. But I think we still need a lot of research in that. And that's where students come in, because I'm not doing that myself. <laughs> no, yeah, no, we, uh, we have lots of students uh, from different schools that, that need uh, to write dissertations. And these are fantastic subjects for them to, to pick up. Yeah, it's a fascinating area. You know, and I, actually, uh, I'll ask you about your colleague. And unfortunately, she, I believe she passed away uh, not, uh, a little while ago. But uh, she was doing some research on the um, the effects of sort of visual media and such yes. on interrogations and, and things like that. And that is a big risk because um, one thing that I have always been concerned about is, let's say, for example, somebody doesn't recall something very well. You put them back into a scenario and all of a sudden they reimagine something with a memory that didn't happen. And, and they, they re envision, you know, sometimes, you know, you ever had a friend tell an old story and it's like, no, that's not how it happened. And let me tell you how it happened. Right. So, uh, that is a risk I think with, with VR too. Um, so yeah, but, but can you tell me about some of the research your, your colleague has done and some of the things that maybe you think should be worked on? Yeah, she was not our colleague. She was an independent researcher from, uh, at Erasmus university of law and uh dr gabi van der veen uh tragic loss died very suddenly a few months ago um she did a lot of um 
but the subjects that we're talking about about how body somebody's perception how he uh, how he or she views an image based on how it's brought uh presented to you for uh, the this, the example that uh, dr van Veen always used was the cover of time magazine uh, featuring oj simpson uh, when he was just apprehended it was a cover in which he was uh, visualized with a, a black uh, bar over his eyes and uh, the image was very um, brownish, uh, very dark. So you, you were looking at it, it looked scary. But that, that does something to your perception about a person. You're not looking at a person, you're looking at a criminal at that point. But the, the, the court was still in, in session. He was not a, uh, uh, he was still a suspect. He, there was no verdict yet. But the public opinion at that moment is against somebody. And I totally leave it in the middle of an if he is guilty or not. That's not my place to say. But the, 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 the way that he was visualized at that moment influenced people. And that will also influence a jury. It will also influence a court. And, and, and that makes all the difference. Uh, one of the other examples that she used is, for example, you have a person that was... Uh, mistreated on the street. There was a big fight and somebody was hit a few times in the face. If I have a, a medical description, a medical report about the, the, the injuries that this person had, and it's a very clinical description, it's very accurate, but this person has several uh, hematomas in, in his or her face at this point, looks blue, it's about 10 centimeters in di diameter, that's a very clean representation. But do I put a picture of somebody whose entire face is black and blue uh, and this person, uh, you you get sympathy for this person in, instead that you're absolutely looking at cold facts. Uh, this can be a good thing or a bad thing depending on what side of the bench you are, but you are influencing and we try to be as objective as possible. We try to find truth, we try to present facts. And where is the, 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 the point that this flips to the other side? How are, can we uh, do justice to the truth and present a picture to somebody without influencing somebody to a certain side. Because a judge in the Netherlands has to make their own observations and he or she draws conclusions. We don't do that. We right. just try to present things as they are. But some things in some people can make somebody not objective. And that's something that Dr. Van Veen did very lot of research to, uh, in. And the same goes with VR techniques depending on the, the, the kind of device that you're using, the kind of feedback that you have, sounds that you play, influences that you're missing from the scene itself because some senses you cannot use. Uh, uh, light fall, uh, uh, pieces of glittering grass on the floor, sounds that you're hearing, uh, uh, smells that you're missing, can in make things prettier or more ugly than they actually are. Those are subjects that still need research. Yeah, for sure. I have two more questions that I have to ask you. The first one is, let's talk about full body composition, where you reconstruct a, a full body, not just a face, but a full body. Can you tell me about some of the work you're doing there? Oh, that's very hard. That's very hard. <laughs> okay. I, I don't think there are many people in, in the world actually doing that. Uh, however, what we are trying to do is, if you have multiplayer VR, we need some kind of representation of looking at somebody's location. And we, we're trying to look at cheap motion capture sensors for that. So the, the, the exact proportions of somebody, deformations of skin, etc., are not important in those cases. So that's one of the things that we are actually looking at. But one of the, the, the things that we also facilitate is forensic radiology. So visualizing uh, the path of a bullet through somebody's body and in a multidisciplinary team, try to test several scenarios that are brought up by the different court parties to use um, Bayesian testing between scenarios based on the, cold, uh, the, the, the hard evidence that's there. In those cases, we need to be able to pose a body in a specific way to, to show, okay, if this body is standing in this pose, I can make an infinite amount of poses to make this fit. But I can, but if this person is standing here, I can absolutely say certain that it's impossible that this shot went this way mm -hmm. because this witness tells us this specific, uh, has this specific statement and this specific statement, we can absolutely say that it can never happen. We can, we can make it fit in another way, but this cannot happen. Uh, at this moment, we can only do that based on skeletal CT data. That's processed by forensic radiologists, uh, that's supported by pathologists. Uh, we also have support from the Netherlands Forensic Institute for that, for the, for the 
for the uh, shotgun residue, for the technical aspects of weapons, how bullets behave through tissue, etc. We just visualize the data. But it, it's a wish of us to, to also be able to, uh, to, to, to get the complete volume uh, besides the skeletal data, to get the tissue data and also make that deform. But there is no real objective good way to do it yet. And there are several problems with it. It's very hard to, to measure somebody. You can use a laser scanner, for example, but you only get the, the, the outside dimensions of somebody and different kinds of tissue behave in a different way. Uh, you can make CT scans and you get the inside, but the person is scanned laying down and tissue uh, uh, falls towards gravity and that, that gives a deformation in your measurement so you don't get the person standing up. That's a very, very big problem. Yeah. And there's several different other things because a dead body is not the same as a living body. So full body recreation is something that actually might be impossible. At least at this point, we cannot do it. And if somebody has any ideas on how to do it, I will gladly hear from you. <laughs> I'll leave that as an open question. Um, I want to ask you, what, what now, looking forward, uh, what are sort of the next steps? You've got PD Vision 3D. That seems to be taking a lot of your time. So what, what does the future look like the, in the short term, the next you know two, two years or so? Uh, too much, <laughs> too much. <laughs> uh, the, the, the big thing, I think it's, it's probably the same as everybody. There's several very interesting developments going on. Uh, the big one is, of course, machine learning, AI models uh, and such. Uh, the thing that I'm actually very interested in is uh, automating as much of our data processing as possible. So we actually want to build a network infrastructure in which it's possible for somebody to upload their data from the crime scene to a central server and that a complete uh, panoramic and uh, 3D presentation will roll out in PD vision. Uh, that means we need some automatic processing, some segmentation on point clouds that needs to be automated. Uh, that, that means that we need some very advanced pieces of photogrammetry based on 360 degree images to place them on a map. Uh, and we try to develop those kinds of things and, and look into if, if it's if it's possible to do it yourself. Other things that uh, uh, ChatGPT4, for example, is a wonderful thing that, that really makes working with complex software very easy for a lot of people. Uh, one of the programs that I really like to use, for example, is Blender. And, it's amazing what you can do with ChatGPT just to generate specific tooling that you need for some cases, just by giving a few prompts and describe what you need and a complete Python script rolls out. Um, maybe I need to edit it in some ways, but it works really well. There was a colleague mm -hmm. in Germany that actually made his own uh, short cone reconstruction tool in Blender using ChatGPT and really wonderful stuff. Uh -huh. So those are interesting techniques that we're uh, looking into. So mostly uh, the workflow, because surveying hasn't changed in a few thousand years and basically all the principles are the same, but the processing of the data and interpretation of the data and extracting specific data uh, that needs to be done by experts at this moment. And in the Netherlands, because we have this very large team of people who are collecting data, we try to support those people by trying to automate as much as possible in the future. And yeah. that's that's my, my goal for the next few years, try from what data can we extract in an automatic, repeatable, and checkable way uh, to make this, this work better and faster and more efficient? Excellent. Alex, can I put up your LinkedIn profile just so people can see? Yes. And if okay. anybody has any ideas about full body reconstruction in a forensic, uh, dependable way, then please contact me. Yeah. So uh, this and is. You probably also. <laughs> well, I, I plan to contact you and talk about it uh, a little bit. And I, in fact, I hope to. I hope to see you sometime in the near future. Uh, hopefully, as uh, you know, we'll be able to uh, uh, get together and chat. Uh, it's always a very promising uh, discussion with you, and um, yeah, and I say this sincerely. I, I always enjoy talking to you. You're, you're, you know, just really knowledgeable. Always great ideas and everything else. And and uh, yeah, just a, a great uh, a great resource and a, and a great person to have uh, to bounce ideas off. So, so thank you very much. Uh, thank you for this conversation. And of course, we also appreciate any input that you have and the wonderful things that you're researching and all the research output that you make and your students. So uh, the, the respect goes both ways. Excellent. Well, Alex, hey, hang back for a bit. I'm going to come back and uh, I'll chat with you. Thank you. And have a nice evening for everybody. All right. Take care. All right, everyone, that does it for this one. And uh, hey, an hour and 20 minutes, what do you know? Well, if Joe Rogan can go four hours, I can go an hour and 20 minutes. No problem at all.
So, uh, hey, listen, I want to thank everybody for their time. I thank you for being here. Uh, some great uh, little comments here. So I appreciate that. Good. Uh, great to see so many people from uh, around the world. And of course, we had some good representation here from the Netherlands today as well. So look, we're going to be back soon, folks. I want to wish you all a great Thursday and see you soon. Bye bye.